Good evening or good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. My name is Jason Maida. Welcome to our Georgia Tech alumni uh, workshop, homebuyer workshop. Uh, I'm with American Pacific Mortgage. I'm going to be your facilitator for our class this evening, or like I said, this afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. I know many of you guys are getting into the Zoom session right now, so we'll allow everybody to join. Uh, it's a pleasure to be able to present this content to you. Uh, this is the, uh, the second installment of the homebuyer workshops that we provide for Georgia Tech alumni uh, throughout the year. We're a proud uh, corporate uh, partner with Georgia Tech. I had the pleasure of being on campus uh, just last week, uh, obviously, it's a beautiful campus. You guys have all been there yourselves, and um, and it's great to spend some time in the Atlanta area. So, um, you know, it's, it's and it's obviously great to be with you guys today. So, um, tonight's class or today's class is going to be very interactive. Um, so, as we go through the um, the the talking points today. Um, we encourage questions. Uh, you can use the Q and A uh, function within Zoom, and we'll go ahead and answer those questions on air. Um, and uh, we'll, we'll also carve out some time at in the latter part of today's session for Q and A at the very end. Um, but we really appreciate your engagement with our with our class. Um, that seems to kind of uh, spark some other uh, conversations with within the class. Now uh, we are a nationwide lender, and this. Uh, this class is being broadcast across the country. So I'd be curious to kind of know where our audience is joining us from. So if, you, if you're comfortable with it, I'd love to be able to have you put your location in the chat just so we can get a sense of where you're joining us from. It's kind of it's interesting to see because um, we're, you know, obviously a nationwide lender, but when we talk about market data, especially specific to housing data, it does vary a bit depending on where you're joining us in the country. All right. And Many of you are doing that, so awesome. Thank you so much. We got some folks from the ATL, Kansas, North Carolina, Missouri, Virginia. Love it. We're all over. We got some SoCal representing, so that's great. Cool. Very cool. I appreciate everyone uh, doing that. Boston, got Boise, so very, very nice. Um, thank you for contributing that. So that'll really help me kind of in our conversations that we have around housing market data. Um, so let's go ahead and dive into our, our class and um, just a little bit about me. Obviously, I'll be your presenter this evening, um, but I get a chance to teach classes like this throughout the country. Usually we do one to two classes a week for different partnerships to support our communities in home ownership. Um, I've been in lending for over 20 years. I um, Not only do I educate, but I actually work one-on-one -on -one with clients. So many of our graduates from our classes work with me on their home buying plan. And so you, you know, if you do decide to go on that path towards home ownership with us, uh, you'll be working with me directly. Um, we already had a question in the chat, which is, are we recording tonight's class? And yes, we are. So we are going to record everything. All of tonight's class will be posted on our YouTube channel. And then the deck page from our presentation will also be sent out to you via email as well, too. All right. Um, and then, um, you know, I work for an organization called American Pacific Mortgage. Uh, we are a, a nationwide lender. Um, we usually have brick and mortar offices in all states. Uh, but for the most part, you know, in, in today's, uh, you know, technology world, you know, we do most of our stuff via video with our clients as we kind of consult with them. And we're, we're, you're going to learn a little bit more about consultations here later on in our class. Well, here's our talking points for today. Like I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk a little bit about the housing market. Um, we are going to do um, a, a quick analysis of where interest rates are at. We got some um, economic news that came out today that I'm going to share with you that I think will be helpful for you in understanding kind of where this market is at and hopefully where it's going. We're going to do a rent versus buying analysis in just a few minutes. We'll also talk about credit and give you some resources and some tips on managing your credit. We'll also look at student loans and how those can impact qualifying. We'll talk about loan programs, documentation that we generally need to start gathering together if we want to get pre-approved for our home financing. We'll also look at various first-time buyer programs that are available all across the country. There's also state-specific first-time buyer programs. And then we'll kind of wrap up tonight's discussion looking at the workflow of buying a house. So after tonight's discussion, you may say, hey, I think I want to design a plan for myself and set some goals and objectives for home ownership. We'll show you how to do that and then some of the milestones that you're going to experience as a future buyer. All right. So that's our plan for tonight. Again, thank you so much for being a part of this class. And, uh, you know, we'll answer questions as we roll through tonight's presentation. But let's first of all talk a little bit about 
what buying looks like and does it make sense for me as a future first time home buyer? Because the reality is this is going to be probably one of the biggest financial decisions or investments you're going to make in your upcoming futures, right? Um, and when you think about renting, which you're currently probably doing right now versus buying, we want to consider some of the benefits that come along with owning a home. We have the opportunity to create stability or hopefully affordability in home ownership, even though home prices are still super high and interest rates aren't ideal. But this allows you to kind of control your budget a bit. Um, as your home grows in value and the difference between what the home is worth versus what you owe on your mortgage balance, that difference is called equity. And equity creates wealth over time. And perhaps that can create generational wealth for you and your family. And there's also some tax benefits that can still be available with owning a home, potential de tax deductibility of interest in owning a home. So we're thinking about this major decision that we're going to have to make at some point and doing all of our, our kind of due diligence. We want to factor in the, some of those benefits to the equation of buying versus renting. We want to kind of help you figure that out in tonight's class by looking at a rent versus buying calculator. And I'm going to uh, screen share um, a calculator. And like I mentioned earlier, all this content that we're going through tonight, we're going to send that back out to you tomorrow, um, as well as, of course, this will be recorded for you to, to do some look back as well. But I want to walk us through our rent versus buying calculator. This is brought to us by Freddie Mac. You may have heard of that uh, name before. Freddie Mac um, supports the originations for conventional loans across the country. The, the two major um, sources uh, uh, or resources for conventional loans would be Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae. Um, you heard them a lot back in the 2008, 2009 kind of economic housing challenge that we had. But Freddie Mac is bringing us this cal uh, calculator. So let's kind of walk through it together. Um, and so we're going to kind of build a, a case for what does it look like in renting right now versus what it could look like with owning a home. So let's kind of plug in some numbers. And for time purposes, I've kind of pre-filled in some stuff for you. So we have, you know, let's say a rent of $2,000 a month. We have renter's insurance estimated at $15 a month. We have expectation that our rent would go up 5% on an annualized basis. We have now the home buying scenario, which I, I do realize we're all joining us from different parts of the country. So housing costs look a little bit different depending on where you're tuning into us from. But let's say we have a 425 purchase price. You're going to learn a little bit more about um, loan programs in tonight's class, but we have a 3% minimum down payment, which would be $12,800. 3% is the minimum down payment for a first time buyer. And then we have estimated property taxes, which can also vary depending on where you're purchasing in the country. We have homeowners insurance costs. We also have maintenance costs of a home. Um, you know, if you have to make any repairs on your home. In fact, I had the joy of getting uh, an air conditioning unit repaired today. So, you know, things like that, we want to we want to build those into our maintenance costs um, when it comes to owning a home. Because think about it, when we have major expenses for our home, it's not something that we're going to be able to call our landlord, right? So we have to carve that into our budget. And then loan information wise, we have a 30 year fixed mortgage. We have an average interest rate of about 6.6 .6 to 6.8%, depending on the day in the market. We have origination costs. Those are the costs that a lender is gonna charge you for your closing costs. One of the cool things we have with our partnership in Georgia Tech al alumni is that we actually discount our origination services um, to be able to help make things more affordable for our alumni. All right. And then we have uh, discount points, which we'll talk a little bit more about in just a minute, minute. But what discount points allow you to do as a buyer allows you to pay additional expenses to help bring down the level of interest rate. I'm not a big fan of doing that unless we have to in today's market, because it usually takes about three to four years to break even on those investments. And then we have other settlement services like title and escrow fees, attorney fees, um, things that we want to, you know, kind of put that into our budget of things that we have to put out of pocket. Closing costs generally will be on estimated about two to 3% of your purchase price. And then we have other assumptions like the appreciation rate of our home on an annualized basis. We have how long we're going to be in our house. So in this side-by-side -side comparison, we're going to say we're going to be in that house for seven years. We have selling costs of the home. So eventually when I sell my home, then I'm going to have costs for realtors and closing costs, things of like that, state and federal taxes. And then we want to kind of bake in the savings rate, which obviously we know savings rates are pretty strong right now. So when we do this comparison, 
we we first of all got to realize that our rent budget of two thousand dollars is going to have to go up if we want to purchase um, for the most part. Now, certainly we can bring down our purchase price and get a closer uh, monthly mortgage payment as to our rent. But if we're going to buy at four twenty five, our expectation is that our payment will go up to about thirty six hundred dollars a month. So there there's a jump in our outgo. At the same time, the opportunity, if we look at the next seven years of owning versus buy, owning versus renting, we have about a $50,000 upside of owning a home versus renting. And how do we get there? Well, it's attributed to appreciation of my home over time in the next seven years, also attributed to tax deductibility of interest. Uh, and then, of course, we're not seeing a rent, um, a, a monthly rent. Uh, increase, right? Uh, or annual increase in rent on a monthly basis. So those are all things that we want to take into consideration in our rent versus buying calculator. Now, we had a question that came in the Q&A, which was, are interest payments tax deductible if you're not taking the standard deduction? Um, so I say potentially interest can be deductible. I would encourage you to talk to a tax advisor. Unfortunately, I can't give any tax advice, but I would encourage you if you're considering homeownership to talk to a CPA or maybe a tax advisor um, because everybody's tax situation is a little bit different. Now, I would encourage our class to, if you have time, try to do that calculator yourself. I think that can be really enlightening to see what this could look like for you. The last thing I would leave you with on a calculator is, you know, if we do decide to buy in today's market, we are at elevated interest rate levels. And for most of our clients that are buying today, they're probably going to be refinancing in the next year or two years once rates kind of more normalize. So that calculation could be more uh, uh, favorable for some of our buyers because, you know, if you're going to refinance in year two or year three, your overall cost of your home will go down and hopefully your home will continue to appreciate, right? Um, so, and question in the Q and A was, is the Freddie Mac calculator nominal or, or real dollars? So it's, it's set up as, as real dollars. All right. Great questions. Appreciate it class. All right. Let's talk a little bit about the housing market. We're going to give you national housing market trends. We're all over the country in today's class. If you do have specific markets that you would like us to kind of do research for you and talk about, uh, we can certainly, something we can do during our consultation, but this kind of shows you a snapshot of the nation's housing trends. Median home price, about $432,000 across the country. You can see kind of our trajectory in home prices here kind of moving up. Why is that happening? And, and by the way, I, I taught a class yesterday here in California uh, for Southern California markets. It had a very similar trajectory, which we're seeing home prices go up, even though we're in a higher interest rate environment. And, and we're here because we just don't have a lot of inventory still on the market uh, for, for the demand of buyers that are out there. Now, we're expecting about a 10% lift in inventory but still not enough inventory to support the buyer demand. So even though we're in the high sixes to 7% range, still a lot of buyers out there looking to enter the housing market. Now, new home builders are trying to construct projects to be able to support the, the gap that we have in our inventory, but not all markets can support new housing just because of dense, you know, there might be more densely populated areas. Um, the cost of construction obviously is, is not the greatest at this point. So, there's there's a lot of kind of contributing factors to why we're seeing that home price uh, kind of rise, even in a, a higher interest rate environment. Speaking of interest rates, today, as I mentioned to you, as we launched into today's class, a lot of economic news came out today, one being the Consumer Price Index Report, which basically measures inflation. It's one of the leading indicators the Federal Reserve uses to monitor what's going on with inflation. We obviously feel the pinch from an inflationary perspective. Things are more expensive. We go to the grocery store. It's going to be more expensive to buy whatever goods we're looking at. Um, gas prices are still high, right? So we're the energy prices are high. So we're we're all feeling that. And when we look at why we're here from an interest rate perspective, is the Federal Reserve has been elevating interest rates to try to combat inflation. The inflationary goal for the Federal Reserve is two percent, and we're still a, a long ways away from that. Um, initially, when we entered 2024, we expected rates to come down three times this year from the Federal Reserve. It looks like we may only get one rate cut this year based upon kind of the language we're getting from um, uh, Jerome Powell, who's the Federal Reserve Chair. Um, 
so interest rates are kind of like moving all around a little bit. Now, that being said, we did get some positive news from that CPI report today, which showed inflation softened a little bit. It actually cooled month over month. So interest rates kind of rallied a little bit behind that, um, you know, with some speculation that we will see rates be cut at some point in time. So interest rates came down about 0.125 to 0.25% uh, on average. And you can see kind of over the last 12 months what interest rates have done. Um, you know, even though we're at elevated interest rates, as I just mentioned, it's still not really changing buyer demands, but it's certainly changing buyer affordability, right? Um, as we look back at this chart here, this kind of big mountain peak here of, of this blue line, that represents the 30-year fixed mortgage. Back in October, we saw rates reach an 8% level. Now they've come down dramatically from that, but that was kind of a scary time right there. It changed affordability dramatically for our clients, but we have seen a nice rally in the markets and we've kind of bumped around a little bit. Today with the um, softer CPI report, that represented um, an improvement of rates over the last four months. So we probably had the best rates we've had in the last four months in today's market. So encouraging sign there. Obviously, we like to see a lot more relief um, to help support our buyers across the country. Now, interest rates are not the same for all buyers. And I think that's really important to understand because a lot of clients that we'll work with will say, hey, well, my coworker received this interest rate or my you know, my family was able to get this interest rate. And you know, there's a variety of different variables to interest rate. It has to do with market conditions, but also has to do with credit eligibility, um, type of product you're going to select, how much you decide to finance, what your minimum down payment looks like. And you can invest cost into bringing down your interest rate. We call those points. One point is a equivalent of 1% of your loan amount, which generally will bring down your rate about a quarter percent. And then the term of your loan can also influence interest rates. So if I decide to shorten my term from where traditionally most first-time buyers are at, like a 30-year fixed term, if I go to a 15-year fixed term, that can help lower my overall interest rate. All right, a couple questions that popped in. Um, do rates tend to vary with the time of year? Like, do people buy more and uh, buy more and increase demand in certain seasons? So rate-wise, um, Rates are can change seasonally, but it's more going to be economically driven. So, you know, we may have some challenges in the winter months economically that might influence interest rates. We're not going to see that as much um, as we will from a housing perspective. So traditionally, there's seasonality in our housing market. So spring and summer months are generally the busier in the housing market because you have more people going out, nicer weather. You may have families that are trying to transition to maybe a different school district, whatever the case may be. But interest rates can actually change every minute during the trading day. Um, so, you know, that's things that we have to watch in the lending world on a on a minute to minute basis. Um, and then will you be covering uh, the, dif the differences between a 15 year and a 30 year? I think that meant to be arm uh, as well as pros and cons. We're going to talk about products in just a little bit. So I'll kind of hit on pros and cons when we get to our product section. So we'll we'll we'll, we'll take care of that as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about credit. Um, and you know, when I think about the, all the buyers that I work with throughout the year, there's usually kind of two challenges. It could be credit driven or it could be asset related because we just don't have enough funds saved. So we try to provide a lot of educational tools, both on the savings side of things, but also credit wise. And so we're gonna look at credit right now so we can get some tips and resources to you. Um, but let's first of all, talk a little bit about what goes into the score calculation for the mortgage FICO score. By the way, there's three different models to FICO scoring. There's credit card modeling, there's auto financing, and then mortgage models. So of course, in home financing, we're going to use the mortgage model. Um, this is what it looks like. So there's 15% is going to be how long have I had credit. So the more mature my credit file is, the better my score could potentially be. 20% is going to be how many new accounts am I trying to open and activate? Also, am I trying to get more inquiries out there? Am I trying to obtain more credit through hard and credit hard credit inquiries? Now, in starting our process with our team, we only start with a soft credit inquiry. The reason why we do that is because many of our first-time buyers have a longer buying timeline, and when you have a hard inquiry, that can potentially damage your credit. So we always start with a soft credit check because some buyers may be on a path that's one to two years out from actually moving forward and starting their home search. 30% is going to be around revolving accounts. Um, 
or we, we look at more utilization of credit. So that's taken into consideration our aggregate totals in terms of limits versus balances. So if I'm at $10,000 in limits, but I have a $5,000 in net balances, I'm now at 50% utilization. Our optimal level of utilization percentage should be below 10% utilization. If you kind of struggle to maintain um, your credit card levels and maybe you're at 80 or 90% utilization, we'd encourage you to get below 50% utilization of credit. Okay. Now, one of the tips I would share with you around managing utilization would be to take a look at your statement tonight when you have some time. There's two key dates to look at. We're all familiar with our due date because that's when we obviously have to make our payment to our credit card company. But there's also the statement date or the billing cycle date. That's the date that basically closes out all your activity from the previous 30 days. Why that's important is because at the end of that statement date, the credit card issuer is going to send out all your payment information to the credit agencies. And our tip for you on this is that if you can pay down your balance before the end of the cycle date um, or pay it off, then you're going to get a much lower balance reported out to the agencies, lower your utilization, and, and in turn, hopefully give you a higher credit score, right? So if you're preparing to buy, I would encourage you to kind of take that step in how you manage your credit balances. 35% is going to be payment history. That's how I've obviously paid my bills. Um, if you have any late payments, they're going to be rated as 30-day lates. 60 day lates and 90 day delinquent accounts. So the more severe I have in delinquency, the bigger impact I'm gonna have on my score. Um, now in the most recent six to 12, maybe 24 months that I've had any type of negative events on my credit report, that's gonna be the biggest impact to my score. Every loan product has a minimum credit score and you can see some of those on screen here with the FHA conventional and, and VA home loan products. Um, so they're all gonna have a minimum credit score that's attached to them. Um, now, one of the other tips I want to give you um, is around how you look at closing out of credit card accounts. So, for example, if I've had an account for, let's say, 10 years and I decided to, to close out that account because I no longer use that or maybe it's a high, it has a high annual fee, whatever the reasoning behind that, if you close out an account, just be careful because when you close out a credit card, it takes away all the history from the credit bureaus. And it could hurt you from a length of credit perspective, but also it lowers your utilization because now you have less credit limits that are outstanding, all right? In home financing, we always look at the middle credit score for all three agencies. So the three agencies are TransUnion, Experian, and Equifax. As a consumer, let's say I'm at 760 is my best score, 740 is my middle score, and 720 is my lowest score. In that scenario, we're going to take 740 as the middle score for qualifying purposes. Okay. Now, if my partner is now going to join my application, we're also going to look at our partner's credit. And let's say my partner's 720, 700, and 680, then my partner has the lowest middle score, which is 700. So that's going to be used to evaluate my eligibility or our eligibility for interest rate, product offering, uh, possibly the cost of the mortgage insurance. So all those things are going to be super important when we have those conversations with your home buying plan. This matrix here kind of shows you how long negative items will remain on your credit report. Um, now, as I mentioned earlier, events in the most recent 12 to 24 months are going to be the be the biggest impact, but this is how long they'll actually visibly be on your, your credit report. Some of our clients do have challenges just getting started in credit. And, you know, there's still a lot of helpful tools out there to start in credit. One of the things I always recommend for those that are just getting their credit started, if you don't even have a credit card, I'd encourage you to talk to your, your local bank, maybe that you use for your, your banking institution, talk to them about maybe some type of get started credit card, or maybe a secured credit card. Experian also offers tools to help you kind of build credit through the Experian boost system, which will basically take items that are like, like your rent payment or your car insurance or your cell phone bill and be able to use those as kind of manual accounts that show on your credit report to start showing credit worthiness. All right. All right. Student loans are something that comes up in our conversations with clients. And I know student loans are in repayment right now. Um, you know, some of us are going through federal student loan forgiveness, and that's great. Uh, you could have public employee uh, forgiveness as well, where you have a 10 year period where those student loans will be forgiven at the end of 10 years of service. So all that's great. Um, depending on the status of your student loan, if you do have an existing balance, we do have to count some type of minimum payment in the qualifying uh, component. 
Um, if you're on an income-based repayment amount, then we use the income-based income, pay, income -based repayment monthly amount. So in our scenario on screen, if I had $75,000 in student loan debt and my payment was two fifty dollars per month for the I, IBR payment, that's what we would use for qualifying purposes. If I don't have an income-based repayment amount set up, but I have that outstanding balance, if I'm looking at a conventional product through Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, generally we'll use 1% of the balance as the monthly payment. And if we're using a Federal Housing Administration loan or FHA loan, it would be 0.5% of those outstanding balances. All right. If you're back in school, you're on deferment, or maybe you're still in forbearance, even those are in kind of a deferred situation, we still have to count that minimum payment for qualifying on student loans. So let's talk a little bit about some of the loan programs. I know we had a question earlier about differences between 30-year fixed and 15-year and fixed mortgages, and we'll, we'll dive into that a little bit. These are some of the kind of the main programs that are offered as lenders to buyers. And we're going to kind of spend some time doing a little bit of a high level look at each one of these products. The first one we talked a little bit about is the conventional loan, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac product. Your minimum down payment on using those products is going to be 3% of your purchase price up to a loan amount of 766550 Now, looking at the in the chat and our attendance um, is kind of all across the country, there are high cost of living areas that have higher loan amounts that allow us to increase that amount financed, but it also comes with it a slightly higher down payment. So if you go beyond 766550 that minimum down payment moves from 3% to 5%. So I know as you know, we have one of our guests from Boston, like that would be a high cost of living area if you're in Southern California, high cost of living areas. We can give you there's there's quite a few different counties, obviously, that that you know have high cost of living. Um, we can kind of talk offline a little bit about some of those higher loan amounts. Um, FHA loans are going to be our um federally insured loans. Um, they are um have a minimum down payment of three and a half percent. They also have loan amounts that can vary by location across the country, but kind of the baseline loan amount is 766550, which is that conforming limit loan. FHA loans, as compared to a conventional loan, is going to be going to be a little bit more flexible from a qualifying perspective. If I had maybe a late payment on a credit card in the last 12 months or 24 months, FHA is going to be okay with that. It might be a little more challenging with a conventional loan. FHA also has with it slightly lower uh, credit score requirements down to 580, whereas a conventional loan has a 620 minimum credit score. The VA Home Loan is an amazing product for our veterans. It's called the VA Home Loan, provides up to 100% financing for the veteran, has a lot more flexibility from a guidelines perspective, whether it's credit, whether it's expenses versus income. Uh, the VA Home Loan can also go beyond a million dollar loan amount and still have a zero down payment option. For our veterans that have served and maybe have some type of VA disability benefit, um, they could be exempt from having to pay what we call as a VA funding fee. And a VA funding fee is generally about 2 to 2.3% of the loan amount, but that gets um, forgiven, so to speak, if you have any type of VA disability. And then USDA is going to be for our clients that want to purchase in more rural areas. Uh, USDA stands for the United States Department of Agriculture. Um, there's two big qualifiers to use that product. It's the location, so it has to be deemed a rural area by USDA. Um, and you also have to meet the household income requirements, so you can't exceed that income requirement um, to be able to use the product. So the, the, the income qualifiers will vary based upon where you're trying to purchase. And then the jumbo loan product will have slightly higher um, credit score requirements at a 680 score. Um, there's also a little bit higher asset requirements. The jumbo loan is going to be in place for clients that need to buy higher than what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac or maybe FHA can support the home purchase at. It does have a 10 to 15% down payment, like I said, higher credit score requirements. Not many of our first-time buyer buyers will go towards a jumbo product. It's going to be more for a second-time purchase. Um, but jumbo loans also have with it additional asset requirements. So not only should I save up for my down payment and my closing costs, but there's also reserve requirements, which can be up to 12 months of my equivalent monthly mortgage payment. So, you know, if I have an $8,000 mortgage payment and I have a 12 month reserve requirement, I would need an additional $96,000 in assets after I've contributed my down payment and my closing costs. 
Now, I was asked to talk a little bit about the difference between a 30-year fixed mortgage and a 15-year fixed mortgage. There's advantages to shortening the term of your loan in most markets where when you shorten the term of your loan, your interest rate can also be lower up to about a quarter to half a percent in interest rate. That's in more normal markets. Right now, we're in kind of a, a weird market because there's an inverted yield curve happening right now where short-term rates are intersecting long-term rates. So it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense to go down to a 15-year product in today's market. Might look different in a couple of years. Um, the disadvantage of going to 30 year from a 30-year to a 15-year is going to be the, the elevation of the payment, right? So the payment's a much more increased level. Um, and it could change your household budget, right? So you might not be able to have as much buying power having that shorter term loan. Most of our clients, I would say 95% of our clients as first-time buyers are going to elect a 30-year fixed mortgage product to create the most affordability. And as I mentioned earlier, those that are buying right now in the 2024 market are probably going to refinance in a couple of years. And maybe at that time, if maybe their income streams change a little bit, it might make more sense to use a shorter term product. Um, question came in, which was, how do you look at income for small business owners, um, sole proprietors, et cetera? You know, let me let me cover that question in our income section, because we're going to go through that um, in about 10 minutes. Um, we'll kind of talk through that a little bit. I do want to spend some time talking a little bit about PMI, which is private mortgage insurance. You may have heard about that terminology. What PMI does, it essentially insures the lender against default of their of the buyer's mortgage. So if somebody had some challenges and couldn't pay their mortgage, the lender is insured against that default. Now there's different types of, of PMI. There's conventional private mortgage insurance and there's government mortgage insurance. I'm explaining to you both of them. So the conventional product gives you various options on how you pay PMI. You can pay it monthly. You can split some of it up monthly, some of it up up front. You can basically pay a a single premium where you essentially increase your out-of-pocket expense to buy out the MI. You can also take an elevated interest rate and buy out the MI that way. That's not really a, a much of a, a popular option. The most popular option is monthly MI because with monthly mortgage insurance, you're able to cancel the mortgage insurance generally when you have two years in that loan and 20 to 22% equity. Um, now, mortgage insurance is calculated based upon your credit score, what your down payment is, and then how much you finance. Um, if any of you in tonight's class have done some searches on Zillow or Redfin, which you probably have, um, those calculators that you'll find there generally aren't super reliable because those aren't taking into consideration those factors that we have here on screen. All right. Now, when we look at our own calculation of the conventional PMI, and we have a loan amount of 450,000. So if I took that loan amount of 450, I was putting down 3%, I had a 740 credit score. My premium is about $183 a month. All right. So that's what we now the higher I can move my credit score up, the more I can put down, the lesser I'm going to pay in mortgage insurance. Now, on the other side of it, there's FHA mortgage insurance, which is government insured insurance. And when we look at PMI on the FHA side, there's two components to it. There's upfront mortgage insurance, which is 1.75% of my loan amount. And that gets added to my month or to my total balance. There's also monthly mortgage insurance, which is the equivalent of 0.55% of that loan amount. And then we divide it by 12, and that's how we come up with a dollar figure monthly. If we look at that calculation on the same loan amount of 450, now we're going to have upfront mortgage insurance of 78.75 that gets added on top of that 450. And then I have monthly mortgage insurance, which is 206 per month. Now, with FHA mortgage insurance, it does not have a cancellation option. So the only way I can cancel out of mortgage insurance is if I decide to refinance maybe over to a conventional product, All right? So looking at that side-by-side -side comparison, you may say, well, why would I ever consider FHA? Because it's a lot more expensive. You know, I'm adding that upfront plus the monthly is a little more expensive. And you're absolutely right, but you know, not all clients will qualify in our conventional product. And so, you know, we want to create options for our clients. Um, so if I've had some challenges in my credit, uh, maybe my credit score is a little bit lower, or if I had some late payments, we still want to provide opportunities for homeowners home ownership and the FHA could potentially do that. Uh, okay, so let me just answer another question on PMI, which is for PMI, what home value do they use to calculate equity percentage? If the home has appreciated significantly uh, for the first two years, is that taken into account? So the answer is yes. So the uh, whoever your servicer is at 
um, for your lending will, once you've hit the two-year mark, you can apply essentially to have your mortgage insurance canceled and they'll do an appraisal of the property to see what the home is worth, what your balance is. And if you've achieved that 20 to 22% equity, then you can follow the cancellation process. I think another question that came in the chat, um, well, maybe Ken will help me out with that. Um, okay, so I'll just answer this really quick and then we're gonna talk about documentation. Um, what is the best way to decrease overall costs when buying a home? Is it to increase the down payment or are there other ways? Um, so there's a, there's a variety of different ways to decrease the costs. Um, you know, we have to kind of, first of all, clarify what costs we're looking at. It could be the cost of the closing costs. It could be the monthly expenses. Um, there's a variety of different ways to achieve, you know, uh, decreases in both. Um, at times in the market, you know, you can negotiate with the seller to help them take on more of the cost burden of the home purchase from a closing cost perspective. You can also at times have the sellers that are willing to give you a credit to help bring down your interest rate. The lower my interest rate goes, the lesser my monthly payment is. As a buyer, you can also, like we talked about earlier, use out-of-pocket expenses, discount points to bring down your interest rate, even though we wouldn't recommend that. And then, of course, you can increase your down payment. Um, so those are, there's a variety of different ways to get there. As we meet with our clients to kind of go through different scenarios, we're going to kind of figure out what's the best way to hit those goals and objectives for homeownership. So good question. Let's talk a little bit about documentation and, and, and income sources for um, home buying. These are kind of a list of the, the typical items we need to start the process, like the last two years of W-2s, taxes, bank statements, um, last 30 to 60 days of pay stuff. So that's generally what we're going to need. I think it's also helpful to understand income scenarios too. Um, you know, there is a two-year rule in lending, but the way the two-year rule, rule works, it's a little bit misinterpreted at times, but Basically, we have to have at least education supporting our, our work or be on the job at least or show work history of two years. So what I mean by that is if I graduated from Georgia Tech, four-year degree, and now I just started my job January 1, I can use my educational history along with my new employment to make up that two-year requirement, okay? And in some cases, you know, I may be starting a new job. I've been in the workforce, but I have a new job opportunity in some cases, I can apply with that offer letter for that new job for my home mortgage financing. Where that two-year rule can be a little more challenging is that if I have dual employment, so let's say I'm in like the medical field, right? And I work at two different clinics and I wanna count both streams of income. In that case, I do have to show that I've been on both jobs for two years simultaneously. For self-employed individuals, which I know we had a question that came in about that, you do have to show that you have two years of tax filings um, to be able to use um, that income. So you have to basically be in business for at least two years. As income goes, how we calculate um, self-employed individuals' income, it, it varies a little bit depending on the type of tax structure, whether it's LLC, S-Corp, C-Corp, sole proprietorship, um, but generally, you know, as a rule of thumb, they're going to average the last two years of income and it's net income for self-employed individuals versus W-2 employees. We look at gross income. So it's a little bit different, different approaches. Um, now, if you have additional streams of income, like let's say you have a partner that's in the household, but not going to be on the application, the only way to use your partner's income is to have your partner join you on the application. Some loan products will also add uh, rental income. So if you have like border income for someone that's renting a room from you, if that's gonna carry on to your next property that you purchase, that could be potentially income that's used. But for most products, they're not gonna allow you to, to use border income. Um, let me answer a quick, quick question in the chat, uh, which is uh, assuming, um, I've heard everything correctly. Uh, why don't you recommend a buyer to purchase points to lower the interest rate? So I'll just kind of go back to that really quick. The reason why I don't necessarily recommend points is because there's a break even scale on that, which basically means I want to get a good return on, on my investment. So if it takes me three or four years to break even on those investments, but at year two rates are more favorable and I decide to refinance, since I've only got halfway there to the break even point, it doesn't necessarily make sense to invest those points. Now, some clients just need to because they're trying to achieve a certain payment level, but rule of thumb, it doesn't necessarily make a lot of sense. Any questions about income before we kind of move on to our next component of income and expenses? All right. 
Okay, I want to keep us on track. Um, question was in the in the chat, which is just uh, how hard is refinancing? Refinancing doesn't necessarily it, it should shouldn't be a, a difficult process. Obviously, it doesn't happen a lot right now because of the way the interest rate environment is. But you know, it's 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 a it's an opportunity where we can get a chance to consult with you and see if it even makes sense. I mean, there's a lot of lenders that unfortunately. Um, do just refinancing to prey on people that are considering refinancing. And I think it's important as a consumer that eventually when you do become homeowners, that we make sure that you have a really good, strong return on investment for refinancing because refinancing just to lower your interest rate by a quarter percent does not make sense um, because there's costs involved with refinancing. Um, we'll eventually get to a market where it does make sense to refinance, but right now it does not does not pencil out for most buyers or for most existing homeowners. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about income. I'm, I'm gonna save this question that's in the Q&A and then we'll get back to it. But I wanna explain debt to income ratio. Um, debt to income ratio is taking in your monthly income versus your monthly expenses. Generally, we don't wanna see those expenses exceed more than 43 to 45% of our pre-tax income or net income for self-employed individuals. Um, now, those expenses that we consider are the principal and interest of the mortgage, the property taxes for your new house, the homeowner's insurance, if I'm putting less than 20% down, PMI, if I'm buying a condo or a townhouse, homeowner's association dues, and then I take the other debts that I have, credit cards, personal loans, student loans, car loans, lines of credit, any of that stuff, that gets all factored into our calculation. So you're looking at kind of an example on screen, which is if we had $3,000 in expenses, $8,500 in income, this client's debt to income ratio is 35.29%. Generally, we don't want that debt to income ratio to be more than 45%. Uh, we can go as high as 50% um, per the guidelines. The question I get asked often is what should my debt to income ratio be like to feel comfortable in my home purchase? I find in working with so many buyers that 33 to 36% is kind of the comfort zone, so to speak. Bigger than that, though, is affordability. And that's one of the most important things in home ownership. You know, our two big goals for first time buyers are affordability and sustainability. So, meaning I can sustain this payment level over time. That's a conversation we're going to have as a, as a consultation with you when you decide to kind of map out a home buying plan with us. All right. Uh, I'm going to answer a question really quick, which is, um, we're just, just going to provide some clarity here. In order to include your spouse's income and factor into the home buying plan, they have to be on the application. So the answer is yes. So any income from a spouse or a partner to be factored into the eligibility, they would have to be on the application. All right. Okay, so our last component to building what, what I would call the home buying plan is to figure out our savings, right? And there's ways that we document savings that are going to be used towards down payment and closing costs. Um, this is kind of some of the documents that we would ask for. Retirement accounts can be potentially used. I would encourage you to talk to your tax advisor or CPA before you use those resources because you don't want to create a tax benefit or tax liability for yourself. Um, gift funds can also be uh, used um, when that's where a family member is helping contribute towards your down payment and closing costs. There's no cap on what they contribute for most products. Um, and there's a kind of a documentation process for that. That donor will generally complete a gift letter, will show documentation of the transfer of funds, but there is no seasoning requirement for gift funds. Most asset resources have to be seasoned at least 60 days, but not the, not the case with gift funds. Now, you heard me talk about earlier our two challenges for first-time buyers. It's credit or it's savings. And so I want to give you just kind of a really simple approach to savings um, that seems to work really well with our clients. And um, it's kind of, kind of creating some habits on getting prepared for that mortgage payment. So here's kind of what my thoughts would be in trying to save, uh, try to increase your savings. So let's say, for example, I'm paying $2,000 a month in rent right now. But I think from a budgetary perspective, I can afford $4,000 from a mortgage perspective. So if I think I can do that, but I just can't quite get there from a savings pers perspective right now, because I need to plan for the next year or two years of savings. Here's what I would encourage you to do. Start paying yourself like you're making a mortgage payment right now, which would essentially mean is pay your $2,000 a month rent, have the $2,000 in overage that you have, have that go directly to your savings account. So it's almost like you're having outgo of $4,000 a month in mortgage. 
By doing that, you're going to see your savings grow over time. By the end of six months, you're at $12,000. By the end of the year, you're at $24,000. And that doesn't even include interest that you're accruing on that amount of money. So that's, I think that's a real simple kind of building blocks approach to savings. But you know that tends to be one of the bigger challenges for some of our first-time buyers. Um, before we talk about first-time buyer programs, the question was, are cash deposits are not acceptable? Um, cash deposits are not acceptable unless we can trace back where the funds came from. So we're talking about like actual cash. Like I deposited $5,000 in bills in my account. Those generally can't be used for real estate transaction. Part of the Patriot Act, we have to basically source all of the funds used in a home purchase. All right. So across the country, there's different first-time buyer programs that are available to help support the need for resources for down payment and closing costs. I'm gonna spotlight some national ones as well as specific to the state of Georgia and California, because I know we have some audience members from California. Nationally, Freddie Max supports us with the Borrow Smart program, which can provide up to $500 to $1,500 for moderate to low income households that are gonna to decide to purchase. And that's in the form of a grant. And that grant can basically credit you money towards reducing your total out-of-pocket expense. Um, so that's a, a, a wonderful opportunity for you. In the state of Georgia, there's the Dream Home Ownership Program that basically creates low to moderate income op or options for low to moderate income households. It's assistance from anywhere from ten to fifteen thousand dollars for a first time buyer. And then in California, there's a variety of different programs that are available uh, through Cal HFA. It's the California Housing Finance Agency. A first-time buyer is defined as someone that has not owned in the last three years. So you may have owned a home back in you know, 2018, right, and sold it in 2019. If you have been renting for the last three years, you're still considered a first-time buyer. Um, what I would encourage you to do, since we're in different parts of the country, if you're interested in first-time buyer programs, get connected with us after today's class, and we'll kind of walk you through some of the agencies that are available to help support our low to moderate income households. And you'd be surprised those income levels are, are, are pretty generous levels um, that are there to help support those first-time buyers. All right, let's talk a little, about, a little bit about the buying process. So after leaving tonight's class, you may wanna be you know, kind of looking a little bit more about your options in home ownership. And I, so I wanna explain to you a little bit about the workflow for home ownership. Now, one of the things we would encourage you to do is get connected with us for a free consultation. It's a 30 minute session that we do to help set some goals and objectives for home ownership. I'll explain more about what it looks like later on in our class, but we build kind of the framework for home buying and then the output of that consultation is to get pre-approved for your home purchase. You may have heard that terminology before, your pre-approval allows you to really start the home search. And it's usually good for 60 days, but we can easily recertify that pre-approval for you at any time. So you're not felt like you're, any, you're under any pressure to go out and run out and buy a home right away. But that pre-approval ultimately kind of validates to a seller that you're eligible and you have financing in place. So that's step one after a consultation. Step two is gonna be house hunting. Many of you in tonight's class have already probably started house hunting, right? You're probably on Zillow or Redfin. But this is where the actual house hunting starts, where you're maybe considering making offers on homes. Um, you might start um, going out and visiting physically uh, homes, not just looking at them online. I would encourage you to connect with a local community realtor that can help you in that journey um, of finding the right home that can work for you. Um, we can update our pre-approval based upon what you decide to offer on a home. So out of a consultation, we try to get a baseline number for your eligibility but hopefully you find something that's a little bit less expensive and then we we would adjust your pre-approval accordingly. Now, let's say we find the home that we really love and we want to present an offer. The realtor will help present that offer to the seller. If that offer gets accepted, then we move to step three and that's called entering escrow in more, most parts of the country. Um, so the seller says, yes, we'll accept your offer. At that time, there's some action items that come into place for the buyer, like you have to make a, an earnest money deposit, which is usually 1% to 2% of your sales price. That usually needs to be deposited with the escrow company or the attorney's office within a couple days of the acceptance. Um, as a lender, you're going to get a call from us and we're going to say, hey, congratulations, you did it, you have an accepted offer, we'll give you kind of the next steps. 
We'll also schedule you for your follow-up consultation to get back on video to re kind of re re uh, review the, re the design of the financing, talk about current market interest rates, what your monthly payment's going to look like, out-of-pocket expense. Make sure you have a good, good sound plan because we're going to have a few more steps that are going to come along in the process. And then we'll finally, we'll send out disclosures to you that highlight our conversation that we've had. This is the uh, kind of what the earnest money deposit looks like. So it's usually one to 2% of that sales price. Ultimately what it is, it's a good faith deposit that you're making as um, you know, kind of an investment in the property. And it ultimately will help lower your total out-of-pocket expense. Um, or, or I should say it's going to credit towards your total out-of-pocket expense for the home purchase. All right. Now we've got a few questions that are piling up in the Q and A. Let me, let me, let me address a couple of these and I'm going to kind of move us over to step four in the process. Um, so one question is, can I become a, can I still get first time buyer credits if I do a joint application, but one of the other buyers is not a first time buyer that depends, depends on the state's guidelines. Cause every state has different guidelines for first time buyers, but as a first time buyer with the minimum 3% down requirement, yes, you would still qualify as a first time buyer. As long as one of you is a first time buyer. Um, have the court cases against the National Association of Realtors changed closing costs much? We haven't seen that yet. I, I think it's kind of still remains to be seen how that goes. I mean, we have obviously new clients that are buying homes since um, leading up to that. Um, I think it's just going to look different in terms of how realtors disclose their commissions and how they earn those. So realtors will now have to negotiate their commissions with the selling side of things. It's not just assume that they're earning a commission. But I think as it relates to the buyer's commissions, I don't, I don't think there's really going to be much of an impact from that perspective. And then what if uh, we were to purchase, purchase my own land and build a home? Um, so you can certainly do that. You can purchase land and then you can build a home. It's called construction financing. I will have to say in today's market, construction financing is a little bit challenging, um, but you have to do two things. One, you have to finance the land, which generally requires you to put 50% down at least to acquire the land, and then you can finance the rest, and then you have to get construction financing. It's not ideal in today's market. Um, construction financing is not readily available, unfortunately. Let's get back to the process flow. I want to talk a little bit about contingencies. It means different things in different parts of the country, but ultimately a contingency is part of the contract, allows you to do your homework on the property in the first 10 to 17 days of the contract. That homework includes getting the house appraised, um, getting your house inspected, and then getting your loan approved. So that takes you about like three quarters of the way through the process. Um, step four is going to be the administrative task. We call that processing and underwriting of the loan. We also will have your rate locked in by that time. Um, and we get ready to prepare everything for an underwriter. And at step five, an underwriter reviews everything for the financing, make sure that the income is validated, savings um, that we're using for down payment, closing costs is all validated. And now we're getting to the final stages of the process because now at step five, we're going to issue to you your final closing disclosure. By the way, all your disclosures and financing are sent to you electronically. Um, if you're not you know, in um, online, of course, we can send them to you manually via U.S. mail. But most clients, it's going to be via um, electronic signature. Everything is done electronic signature until we get to step six, which is the closing of the loan. And that happens after your three-day cooling off period from that closing disclosure. The closing of the loan is an in-person process. You'll either meet with a, an attorney or a notary to go over your final loan documents that are sent to you. There's no surprises at that point in working with our team because you've received disclosures all throughout the process. So by the time you get to the closing phase, um, you know exactly what to expect. Um, you, at that time, you'll also wire in your final funds of closing. Your deposit will be credited towards a, that total final amount. And then what happens from there, as a lender, we wire in all the final funds for your, your, uh, your financing. We'll also include the assistance program if you elect some of those programs. And then documents get recorded with the county recorder's office. They'll record usually a grant deed that transfers ownership from the seller to you. They also record a deed of trust, which is your agreement to repay the loan. And after all those rec recording documents get finalized, then we get a chance to celebrate because now you become the official homeowner. And that's a that's a celebration that we love. I get a chance to make those calls uh, throughout the day. Um, and it's it's you know something that doesn't come without you know a little bit of stress and anxiety as you move through the process because this is a super large financial investment for you, right? We understand that. We don't take our, our uh, role in this in this process lightly. Um, certainly, when we get to the end of the process, we want to celebrate right there along with you because it's a big deal. And uh, you know, 
we get a chance to do, like I said, do that quite a few, uh, quite a few times throughout the day. Now, if you're thinking about getting on the path towards homeownership, I mentioned to you the consultation process. It's a 30 minute video session with me to design your home financing plan for you. It includes budgeting, you know, where do I want to buy assistance programs, doing some optimization of your credit, creating all the basic framework for a home buying plan. It's a free service we provide to you. You don't have to feel like you have to run out and buy a house this weekend. We have clients that are looking to buy, you know, year, two years down the road, but we want to just be a partner with you in setting some goals and objectives for home ownership. We also have some great resources that are available to you on mobile. So this is our APM mobile tool available for Android uh, and Apple devices. It allows you to start the application process right there. You can also uh, follow the progress of your loan. You can do calculations. So if you're sitting in front of a house and you want to kind of do some uh, math on what the payment can look like, you can do it all from mobile and have some reliable calculations. Um, I want to kind of jump back really quick um, to, uh, I think I missed a slide here, but this is kind of our get started information. So if you're thinking about starting the home buying process, there's a really simple online application. We only do a soft credit check, like I mentioned earlier in our discussion, and then you'll upload proof of your income and assets, and then you schedule your video consultation using our scheduling tool at your convenience. Um, if you have some follow-up questions from tonight's class that you wanna kind of connect with myself or one of our team members, we have in introductory calls that are available on our scheduling tool as well too. We wanna be here as a resource to help provide as much support as you guys need to make this big financial decision. And as we get to the top of the hour, I would just want to remind you as being a partner with Georgia Tech alumni, we do pass along a closing cost discount to help support you with um, um, options for you and your home finance. And we also have other partnerships across the country. If you have friends, family, coworkers that you think might benefit from our educational classes and tools and resources that we provide, we'd encourage you to have them check out mortgageeducate.com to learn a little bit more about some of our upcoming class schedule. We teach over 60 classes throughout the year. This is one of them. Um, and we're super uh, excited to be able to provide these tools out to our local communities. Here's all my contact information. So if you have questions um, after tonight's class, just want to get connected with me, don't hesitate to call, text, uh, email, whatever's good for you. And on our social channels, YouTube, uh, we try to provide, or obviously you're going to see your, your class recorded there, but we have all, also other helpful videos that we try to post every week, as well as on our Instagram resources to help uh, support first-time buyers. You can follow us at JMADA Mortgage. And of course, we have all of our channels for all our reviews for with our clients. And we love what our community says about us. So with that said, um, I want to open it up for Q&A. We've tried to weave in questions as we've gone through tonight's class, but I do have some in, in the Q&A right now. So we're going to open it up for Q&A. We still have a large part of the class still with us. Well, I appreciate that. You guys hanging on to the very end. That's very cool. So let's talk uh, about some of these questions. Um, so the first one is using calculators like Freddie Mac. If I plan on being in a home for not much longer than my break-even point, would you still recommend buying? For example, if the break-even point is three years and we plan to move in four to five years, is it worth the hassle to set up? Um, and, and or just wait to make the next home purchase. It really depends. I mean, I think that's that's a conversation we need to have kind of as a one on one with you. Um, but I think, you know, investments of of, you know, three years in a home could make a lot of sense, especially if this market turns, if you can get into whatever market you're trying to buy in at a, at a reasonable price and home values to continue to go up. That's a great stepping stone for you in the next purchase. You don't have to necessarily think about buying a house and being there for seven years. I don't think that's necessarily that the approach that you would have to have. Um, another question is I'm going to be relocating and starting a new position. Will I need to wait until I have 60 days of pay stubs? Love the question. That's, that's a good one. So answer is no. Um, we can actually pre-approve you with just a pre-approval uh, with just an offer letter, I should say. Um, so I have many clients, um, that, you know, for example, here, let me give you an example. I have a client that moved back to the United States from the UK. Um, he's going to work in a school district here in California. He has an offer letter to, to be in the school district here in California. He was able to purchase his home, move in when they arrived here from the UK, but we did all the qualifying based upon his um, offer letter. And then after closing of his home loan, then we would get his pay stub at a later date. All right, great question. Um, so question was, what about debt collections? I think, um, Jonathan, if you can give me a little bit more on that question, I'll, I'll answer it for the group, or maybe Ken can can answer that for you. Um, and I see a hand raised. So if you have a question, you can drop that in the Q&A. That's perfect. 
Um, another question is, I think this one's in the chat. So let me. All right. Um, so question was, do we factor child expenses like daycare or private school expenses into the debt to income ratio? The answer is no. Generally, most of the things into the debt to income ratio would be things that appear on a credit report. Um, outside of that, if there's any spousal support and maybe a, a dissolution of marriage situation or child support, that gets added in um, when disclosed on application. But for the most part, it's going to be things that appear on a credit report. Um, if you have most of your assets in investments like stocks, should you sell and keep in your account for two months before looking for a home loan? Another great question. Uh, I would say no. I wouldn't want you to execute any trades on stocks until we actually have an accepted offer because obviously if the market appreciates, we want you to be able to realize those gains. So as long as we can see the stock in um, your brokerage statement, that's fine for qualifying purposes. And then if the offer gets accepted, usually within the first one to two weeks of the acceptance, then we'd probably recommend starting to make those trades. Um. Our debt, okay, so our debt collections included in debt to income ratio. So it depends on what type of debt collection, if it's a collection collection, like um, a collection agency, um, those can be at times factored into the debt to income ratio. Usually if it's a collection account, they're asking for the whole full balance and there's not a monthly amount. So it's gonna do more kind of a, a hit to the credit score versus like impacting the monthly payment, if that makes sense. Um, how far out do you need to start looking for a home and financing? Like if you know when you're going to, your lease is going to end, how far ahead do you want to start the process? Another great question. You guys are coming up with awesome questions tonight. So let's, let's kind of just figure something out. Let's say my lease ends in October, right? So I'm going to end in October. I would probably start getting more serious about looking probably in June or July. And the reason why I say that is if I start, you know, looking in July, let's say I find a house in in july i get an accepted offer in july my house will close escrow in august right because it's usually 30 days now my first mortgage payment on that house is not going to start until october and the reason why that is is because mortgage interest is always paid a month behind schedule and so if you could move into your house in august or maybe september that allows you to prevent a double move so you don't have to move out of your apartment or your rental and have kind of temporary living before you get into your house. So that's what I would probably recommend. So I'd say that's yeah, probably maybe three months before your lease expires at minimum. But I don't think it hurts to start mapping out a plan now for home ownership. Okay. You guys did great on your questions. Is there any other questions I can help answer for the audience? Okay, another one came in just now. Does the account where the down payment is saved need to show direct deposits? Like if I have a money market savings account where I have my most of my money uh, saved. So you no, know, we don't have to, we're not looking necessarily at the deposits that are going into the account. Um, so it, it doesn't necessarily, if, if there's an irregular deposit, um, like it just, you get a random cash deposit, then we'd have to find out where that money came from. But if it's a, you know, it's if there's no, it just hasn't been any deposits because it's like, $10,000 that's been sitting in that savings account for the last six months and there's no other activity, that's totally fine. Um, it's just, if we see things, you know, just entering the account and they're just untraceable, that's when we'll start asking some questions. And then how long after selling a home should we consider buying the next without capital gains? So that's going to be a tax advisor or CPA question. Um, you know, I, unfortunately, I can't answer that question, um, but general rule of thumb, you know, you have to wait at least two years um, and, you know, depending on what you decide to do after the sale of that uh, property. But I would encourage you to talk to your tax advisor about any type of capital gain situation for sure. Right. I will have to say Georgia Tech alum has been the best questions we've had in workshops in the last several months. So you guys did awesome tonight. So really appreciate all the great questions and just a, a you know, just a great group that's joined us all across the country. So we really appreciate the participation. I think we did it. Um, we're just over the top of the hour. I appreciate everyone's support tonight. I really hope I get a chance to connect with each of you and help you with your own home buying plan. If you do have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to us via introductory calls or set up your consultation. Uh, and we'll provide this uh, recorded version link tomorrow. It'll be up on our YouTube channel as well as the presentation. Have a wonderful day. Enjoy the rest of your evening. We'll talk to you soon.